unless they see you fucking from a chandelier, don't let the assholes know anything about you. This was the very first piece of lesbian advice I'd ever received from an actual lesbian named Arlene, who happened to be my boss and principal of the largest public high school in Jersey City. And the reason for this advice is because I'd come to her frustrated after an incident with my co-teacher, an older guy who was married to a lunch lady who put his hand on my leg and asked me to go to a motel room suggesting we might have some sex. <laughs> Did he do this at school? No. I naively offered to buy him lunch as a thank you on the last day for helping in my classroom and he took me up on it drove separately, ordered the sausage and onions on garlic bread, <laughs> and suggested that we extend our lunch at a roadside rent-by-the-hour establishment. I declined, of course, and returned to campus after lunch to notify Arlene about the incident and a new discomfort that I expected to have working with him in my room again. Are you out of your mind? Why would you ever ask that man to lunch? Well, it's something I'd done consistently with my co-teachers in California, a sign of respect and gratitude between two professionals who shared instructional space together. Don't ever do that again. You give people the wrong idea. But how can it be the wrong idea when I'm pretty sure everyone already knows I'm a lesbian? She froze dead as a record scratch, and looked at me like I had five heads. You listen to me, because I'm only going to tell you this one time, and then you're going to have to learn the hard way. And then she said the bit about fucking from the chandelier, <laughs> and assured me she'd take care of the situation, and then she sent me on my way to graduation practice with a, now get out of here. Arlene was a spitfire of a woman in her early 60s who'd graduated from this high school long ago and managed to scrap and claw her way to the top. Stuck in a position as vice principal for over a decade, she took the reins as acting principal when her predecessor left suddenly with a terminal illness. I heard that she'd been passed over for this job several times as a woman and a lesbian competing with straight white Italian and Irish men for leadership positions in nepotistic North Jersey during the Don't Ask, Don't Tell era. She'd been protective of me since the first day I started working there. And that's not to say she was ever particularly nice about it. She held me well above high standards and almost always called me into her office immediately after observing my classroom to give me all kinds of advice on how to do things better. Like the time that she confiscated my grade book and sent me to a math teacher. You're not getting this back until you go learn how to do it right. And the time my students were in literature circles and she asked, what exactly are we paying you for if you're walking around the room and the kids are teaching themselves the great Gatsby? <laughs> and when she summoned me on the last day before summer to hand me a stack of professional books and said, I need you to read every single one of these books and come back after Labor Day an entirely different person. So the energy underneath these meetings was more than just her wanting highly effective teachers in the building. For some reason, she was pushing me to be the best. This tough love on the surface didn't feel very fuzzy or soft, but it was coming from a calloused core of raw maternal instinct from a woman who'd never had any practice being anyone's mother. My own mother cried when I came out to her and told me she'd be less afraid if I wasn't stubbornly pursuing a career as a teacher. Be an artist. Be a park ranger. Go, <laughs> go study the habits of armhook squid in the Arctic Sea. Please be anything but a teacher. As a teacher herself for many years, my mom heard plenty of opinions about gay teachers. 
She told me about concerned parents who called the school after an open house to remove their children from a male colleague's class. He doesn't announce he's gay, my mom said. Parents can just tell, and they don't want their kids around that. And understandably, she didn't want that life for me, dealing with parents who'd accuse me of trying to convert their kids or encourage unsuspecting youth to believe it's okay to be gay because here I am in this classroom teaching haiku unscathed. <laughs> but I'd spent most of my formative years feeling very scathed by adults and peers who seemed uncomfortable with my appearance. This kid, Jason, pantsed me in seventh grade gym class after announcing that he couldn't tell whether I was a boy or a girl. And everybody laughed. And I had to switch softball teams when the pitcher's mom told all the parents that I was trying to be gay with her daughter. I mean, I kind of was. But that's hardly the point. <laughs> and then my ninth grade English teacher assigned a three-part autobiography entitled My Past, My Present, My Future. And for my future, I wrote that I wanted to work with the human brain in some way. I was really interested in psychology and how people's minds worked. Maybe even a brain surgeon, since I did OK dissecting that sheep eyeball in sixth grade. Well, I got my paper back and Miss Nyman had crossed an enormous X on my entire future with a red pen. At the bottom, she wrote me a note. I think you'd make a wonderful gym teacher. So that's when I said, fuck Miss Nyman and fuck brain surgery. If teachers have this much power where they get to just cross out people's dreams, then I wanna be a teacher to keep those fucking dreams alive. Because as much as parents might have a problem with me as a gay teacher, what about all these shitty adults who have a problem with gay kids? I will be their champion, their advocate, an example of what they can dream for themselves beyond the stereotypes of U-Haul driving Home Depot shoppers and fragrant manicured hairdressers with impeccable style. But my determination to change the world as a gay icon started deflating when my mom insisted on buying me a wardrobe of feminine teacher clothes from the Macy's women's section before I started my first day of student teaching. And in those uncomfortable floral frocks that didn't fit my authentic vibe at all, I hoped to stay in the shadows of the closet, turn the lights off on my personal business, and pray to God no one would be able to recognize a woman who preferred the company of other women. When I started teaching in New York City the following year, I confided in a couple of new teacher friends that I was living with my actress girlfriend, and it quickly got around the building that I was gay. And the vice principal started riding my ass and writing me up for some pretty ridiculous things, like chewing gum and drinking coffee in front of my students and putting the date and the time, but not the year, on a hall pass. She suggested I wear even more feminine clothing and start quaffing, feathering, and styling my hair. My discipline file was three inches thick before colleagues began openly speculating that this woman might have a problem with me because I was gay and she was Irish Catholic. But I refused to believe that she could just tell. It's not like she ever saw me being gay. I kept my gay card in my pocket when she reminded me in our weekly meetings that this wasn't the right job for me, that I don't have what it takes. And somehow, in her Irish brogue, this woman annihilated my morale enough that by the end of that school year, I was like, fuck this job. If all it is is constant bullying and squeezing into girl clothes, how am I catching shade even when I'm intentionally editing myself? Maybe my mom was right. People don't want the gays in education. 
But then I met some Jersey Italians who took me for a roast beef sandwich at Fiore's in Hoboken. And they told me they knew a few happy gay teachers in Jersey City, one of the highest paying districts in the state. So I decided not to give up on teaching just yet and moved across the river confident that my friends wouldn't steer me wrong after that sandwich. <laughs> and so that's where I met Arlene. And knowing she was looking out for me made me feel safer than I had anywhere else. So I worked my ass off to become the quietly confident teacher she was grooming me to be, who just happens to be a lesbian, but that's nobody's fucking business. But that warning about the chandelier was yet another familiar proposal to stay cooped up in a box, like veal, stifled from growing into the big, beautiful, gay cow I deserve to be. My queer students were asking me in all kinds of ways to step up and be a role model. They were desperate for any detail of my life, who I was, how I lived. One time at the grocery store, I realized I was being followed and photographed by two girls I recognized from the hallways. And I understand why. I never knew any gay adults when I was growing up, or if I did, I wasn't able to recognize them in the wild. In middle school, we had two female gym teachers who seemed kind of gay. I studied a handful of public figures with crossed fingers like Jodie Foster and Ellen, <laughs> looking for any evidence that they might be grown-up versions of who I could become. But in those days, we were still hanging disco balls and fancy light fixtures in the closet, avoiding confrontations where anyone might try to use queer identity as a weapon to discredit accomplishments and talents. I understand why the closet was the safest place in those days, but I was certain I was not built to live in the world that way. When Arlene started having health issues, she would take days off, something she'd never done in all the time I knew her. Her office sat empty for a few days, and then she'd come back for one, and off a few more days, until one day, she just never came back. No party, no forwarding address, just some rumors she retired and lived down the Jersey Shore with her longtime partner. When the interim principal took over, I felt my layer of protection dissolve. I was on my own now, confronted with sorting her advice into piles. Some of it had to go. I could keep some for myself, but some of it I might be able to recycle for a new generation. I first peeked out of the teacher closet for tie day during our Dress for Success Spirit Week. I went out and bought my very first tie, a bright yellow Jerry Garcia design, and I wore it nervously all day. I definitely looked more gay than usual. <laughs> Worried my students might sense the exhilarated comfort I felt wearing it, I stayed close to my desk all day to avoid attracting too much attention. What if one of them said something critical or mean to test my vulnerability? I don't know how I'd even respond. And I wondered if Arlene would have approved as someone who warned me against being too overtly obvious. But when the compliments started rolling in, my confidence did too. Maybe I could do this more often. I bought some more ties. I started mentioning queer Easter eggs in Shakespeare and including LGBT authors in my curriculum. I started giving equitable writing prompts about identity, stuff I would have wanted to write about when I was in high school. And as soon as I added a confidential survey question to my syllabus, is there anything you'd like me to know about you? A whole bunch of kids started returning them with confessions of pronouns and drag names and various identifiers on the very first day of school. But just as Arlene warned, it wasn't easy or without incident. When one of my freshmen wrote the word dyke on my classroom door, I heard her voice in my head. That's what happens when you hang a rainbow flag in your room. You gave that kid permission. Her worst nightmare, a public shaming visible in the light of day for all to see. 
And even though the kids spelled it (laughs) D-I-K-E, as in a long wall or embankment (laughs) to prevent flooding from the sea, The intention behind it was yet another heartbreaking reminder that I can't change the world fast enough. I looked at that ignorant ass word and I realized there was nowhere for me to hide anymore. My shame burped right up to the surface. I couldn't even bring myself to mention it to my students. Terrified, I'd reveal just how much it hurt me. Horrified, I'd confirm what they already suspected and they'd go straight home and tell their parents. The only thing I could find strength to do was sit with it, uncomfortably, with the word dyke, with my relationship to my sexuality, with the idea that who I really am is getting in the way of who I've always wanted to be. And I realize this may not be the last time that someone tries to pit me against me. My skin stayed so soft hiding out in the closet all that time. I needed calluses, resolved to rub myself against the world and finally build up a tolerance. Look, I am neither agile or acrobatic enough (laughs) to conceivably fuck anything from a chandelier. (laughs) But I can certainly get my ass up there like Cirque du Soleil and swing around knowing that those who anchored the hooks made sure they're strong enough to hold me. Since I started wearing ties and living more authentically, I've started sharing some advice of my own. Several friends have asked me how they can best support their own kids who are starting to explore the spectrum of gender and sexuality. At a holiday party a few years back, a colleague approached me and said, oh my goodness, can I please take a picture of you to show my daughter your style? This is exactly how she wants to dress. My students ask me without shame or hesitation about relationship scenarios and what all the pride flags mean and where to find gender neutral clothing and books with characters like us. My principal escorts parents into my rainbow classroom to assure them that there are teachers on campus invested in equity and creating safe spaces for their children. And so if I keep doing this right, Maybe it'll ripple and spread outward. Maybe someday we'll all be so comfortable celebrating each other's unguarded realness that it won't even matter anymore what's going on up there in the rafters. So for my final exam this year, I gave my 10th graders a writing assignment, an autobiography. My past, my present, my future. And for their futures, they wrote about travel dreams and hopeful career paths and having families of their own one day. One girl who was barely pulling a D in my class wrote that she wants to study exobiology at UCLA and work for NASA. She wants to go to space one day. She turned in her paper three days early. And after I read it, you know what I did? I shared a quote with her from my favorite book. When you really want something, all the universe conspires to help you achieve it. Listen to your heart and trust it, sis. If anyone can do it, it's you. 